And in this class, uh, we'll be going on a journey. It's a, a journey we'll be going on with David and a journey with the Ark of the Covenant to uh, all these places that are noted up on the slide here. Um, sometimes David and the Ark go together and sometimes they go separately. And it's a journey of discovery, uh, definitely a journey of discovery for David and hopefully tonight also a journey of discovery for us. Um, when I was doing this class, I, I picked the topic, but the class sort of led me way in ways that I didn't expect. Um, things that once I saw them were, were obvious to me, but had been hidden before my eyes for years. And hopefully I can open your eyes to some of these things too, and you can see the things that I discovered. One of the things that we're going to see uh, is that David was obsessed. And we're going to discover what that object of obsession was, how his life was driven by it. And we'll see how the reading of Deuteronomy 12, which may seem a little strange for a class that's on David and the Ark of the Covenant, how that reading may have drove that obsession. But we'll get to that later because we have a lot of groundwork to lay before we get there. We'll see how God worked in David's life and how in similar manners he's working in ours. But first let's have a reminder of what the intent of the Ark of the Covenant was. And so we're gonna to turn to Exodus chapter 25 where we're first introduced to the Ark. And in Exodus chapter 25 and in verse 8, uh, God commands Moses and the children of Israel while in the wilderness and says, Let them construct for me a sanctuary, a sanctuary for me, that I may dwell among them. And so he wanted them to build this tabernacle, this sanctuary that he could dwell among them. And when he gets to the ark, um, We'll read uh, verses 21 and 22 of Exodus 25. He says, you shall put a mercy seat on top of the ark. And in the ark, you shall put the testimony which I give to you. And there I will meet with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony. And I will speak with you about all I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. So it was above that ark, between the cherubim, that God's dwelling place was, that he would meet with them. It would be his dwelling place, his dwelling among the children of Israel. He wanted to dwell among his people. And that place was, was symbolized in this ark. Throughout this class, we'll be looking at a number of verses. We're not going to turn them all up because uh, a lot of them are, are familiar Sunday school stories. And if we turn them all up, we would uh, quickly run out of time. So we'll refer to a lot of them, but we will be turning up some as they are appropriate. So we need to start uh, before David even gets involved. <clears throat> we need to start um, when the children of Israel enter the land. We read in Joshua chapter 18, verse 1, which we won't turn up, how the children of Israel, under the leadership of Joshua, after conquering the land, they went to and set up the, uh, the, the tabernacle with the ark, and they set that up in the, in the place of Shiloh, which was in the tribe of Ephraim, as indicated on the map that you should have in front of you. And we know that it remained there throughout the time of the judges. And we know this is the place that Elkanah brought Hannah and his family to worship. It's the place where Eli served as the priest. It's the place where Samuel ministered as a child. 
and it's the place where Eli's sons behaved very wickedly. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, we read how the sons of Eli brought the ark of God to the battle with the Philistines, which was at Ebenezer. And that was a very sad day for Israel. Israel was defeated that day. Eli's sons were killed in battle that day. And we read how the ark of God was taken by the Philistines. The ark was first taken to the Philistine city of Ashdod. And the Philistines put it in the house of their god Dagon. And that did not go well for them or for their supposed god. For they found Dagon fallen on the ground the next morning. They propped him back up. And the next morning they found him with his hands and his head cut off. <clears throat> the Ashdodites did not like the ark in their town. So they shipped it off to the city of Gath. And Gath was smitten with, with tumors. And they shipped it off to Ekron. And again, the people were smitten with tumors. And after seven months, the Philistines decided that they could not bear the ark to remain in their land. And in 1 Samuel chapter 6, we read about how the ark was put on a cart with two cows and an offering to God. <clears throat> and that the cows pulled that cart straight to the city of Beth Shemesh, which on the surface seemed to be a very good choice. It seemed like the cows knew where they were going because according to Joshua chapter 21 and verse 16, Beth Shemesh was one of the cities given to the sons of Aaron. It was a city of priests, but it did not go well with the city of Beth Shemesh, for some of the men there chose to look into the ark and the city was struck with a great slaughter. And so the men of Beth Shemesh were dismayed and said, who is able to stand before the ark of the Lord? And they summoned the men of kiriath Jerem. We may ask why they summoned the men of kiriath Jerem, For this was not a city of the priests. It was not even a city of the Levites. We first hear about kiriath Jerem in Joshua chapter 9. And so we're going to turn that up. Joshua chapter 9. And verses 16 and 17. We read, and it came about at the end of three days after they had made a covenant with them. This is Israel and this, the men of the Gibeonites, that they heard that they were neighbors and that they were living within their land. Now you remember the story, I assume, that the Gibeonites had were afraid of Joshua when he entered the land and they pretended to be from a far off country. And they made a pact with them. And here we see that Joshua found out that they weren't from a far off country. They were from within the land. Verse 17. Then the sons of Israel set out and came to their cities on the third day. Now the cities were Gibeon and Shephira and Beeroth and kiriath Jerem. So we see that. This city was a city of the Gibeonites, a city of the people of the Hivites who made a covenant with Joshua when they came into the land. And we read in verse 23, the consequences of their deception of Israel. He says, 
Joshua says, now therefore you are cursed and you shall never cease from being slaves, both hewers of wood and drawers of water for the house of my God. And so it was their fate that they would be servants to the children of Israel, to the house of their God. And so they had no choice but to take care of the ark. They were to be servants of it. And so they gladly took the ark of the covenant. Now, I may, you may ask the question is of why did the men of Beth Shemesh not send the ark back to Shiloh? Wasn't Shiloh the place that the ark belonged? Wasn't the tabernacle set up at Shiloh? Hadn't it come from Shiloh in the first place? Well, the ark had been in the country of the Philistines for seven months. And it seems that in that time, something happened to Shiloh. We don't know what, but Jeremiah comments on it many years later, Jeremiah chapter 7. And we'll turn that up as well. Jeremiah chapter 7, in verse 12, he says, but go now to the plate to my place, which was in Shiloh, where I made my name to dwell at the first, and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because you have done all these things, declares the Lord, and I spoke to you rising early and speaking, but did not hear it. I called to you, but you did not answer. Therefore, I will do to the house which is called by my name in which you trust, and to the place which I gave you and your fathers, as I did to Shiloh. For I'll cast you out of my sight, as I cast out all your brothers, all the offspring of Ephraim. Ephraim being the tribe where Shiloh was located. We don't know what exactly happened at Shiloh. We're not told. But God forsake that place as the place where his name was to dwell. Was it perhaps destroyed by the Philistines after the Battle of Ebenezer? Uh, perhaps. But we do know that the tabernacle was not destroyed with Shiloh, that the tabernacle was salvaged, and we'll, we'll see more of that later. But we do know that God forsook Shiloh as his place. Psalm 78 also tells us that story, if we turn it up. Psalm 78 and verse 65. Then the Lord awoke as it was from sleep, like a warrior overcome by wine. And he drove his adversaries backwards and he put them on an everlasting reproach. And he rejected the tent of Joseph and did not choose the tribe of Ephraim. And though it doesn't say Shiloh exactly, it's a reference there to the place where his name was to dwell at, it dwelled at the first, because we see the contrast in the next verse, verse 68. But he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved, and he built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth which he has founded forever. And he also chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. And so we see that in his rejection of Shiloh was his choice of David. It was intentional on God's part. Shiloh was rejected because he had now chosen Zion and was to raise up David from among the sheepfolds. And so we will move on to the next chapter of the story. So we saw that before the story of David begins that Shiloh is forsaken. The tabernacle is in storage somewhere, probably kept 
by the faithful priests. And the ark is at someone's house in the hills outside of the city of Kirjath Jerem, which we read of in 1 Samuel chapter 7. And during the entire reign of Saul, there is no official place of worship. There is no tabernacle. In 1 Samuel 16, we read how God had rejected Saul and chosen David as his shepherd. And David is anointed king by Samuel, known only at this point to him and his family. And perhaps it's at this time that Samuel starts to groom David for the kingdom, for his kingship. Perhaps Samuel lends David scrolls so that he can begin to implement the instructions given to a king. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy 17 and verse 18, it says, talks about when Israel would have a king. It says, it shall come to pass when he sits upon his throne on his kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of this law on his scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him. And he shall read it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and carefully observe all the words of this law and its statutes. So perhaps David started his study of the law through the tutelage of Samuel at this time. And he begins to meditate on it as he tends his sheep. We can think of Psalm 119 and verse 97, where David says, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. And perhaps it's during this time that David comes across Deuteronomy chapter 12, which was our reading that we had read tonight. And he notices in that reading six times God talks about a place which he would choose for his name to dwell. And all the things that needed to happen to the, that place, if you wanted to bring a burnt offering, you needed to bring it to that place. You needed to bring your tithes to that place, the place that the Lord God shall choose for his name to dwell. If you wanted to worship God properly, you needed to know where the place was that he chose for his name to dwell. In addition, a few chapters on in Deuteronomy 16, verse 16, if you wanted to follow God law, God's law properly, it states that three times a year, all males are to appear before God at the place where he chooses for his name to dwell. And at this point in David's life, this place didn't exist. There was no place where God's name dwelt. There was no tabernacle. There was no temple. And thus is the start of David's obsession. Where is this place? Where is the tabernacle? Where is the ark? How do I follow the law if I do not know these things? Now, as I say this and call this an obsession with David, it may sound like a strong word. But let's turn to Psalm chapter to the 132nd Psalm. Psalm 132, and we'll start at the beginning of the psalm. Remember, O Lord, on David's behalf all his affliction, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, surely I will not enter my house nor lie on my bed, nor will I give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids 
until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. So we have David, the shepherd in the field, who vows not to return to his house until he finds that dwelling place for God. And we know that this vow happened while he was still a shepherd in Bethlehem because, as we read in verse 6, he says, Behold, we heard of it in Ephrathah, and we found it in the field of Jair. Let us go into his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, to thy resting place, thou and the ark of thy strength. Let thy priest be clothed with righteousness, and let thy godly ones sing for joy. And we know Ephrathah is just is another name for this for the town of Bethlehem. And so the only time that David lived it in Bethlehem was up until his fight with Goliath. After that, he went into the household of Saul, and then after that, he was fleeing Saul and then was king. So if he heard of it in Ephrathah, it was his time as a shepherd. And he found it in the field of Jair. And if you look at that word Jair, it's the same word that's used in the city of Kirjath Jerem. Jerem being the plural, Jair being the singular. Kirjath Jerem is the city of forests. The, he found it in the field of the wood or the field of the forest. It's a reference to the same place. So while he was still living in Bethlehem, he sought and he found the ark in Kirjath Jerem. And he goes on to further discoveries. Verse 10. For the sake of David, thy servant, do not turn away thy face from thine anointed. The Lord has sworn to David the truth from which you will not turn back. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. And I'm convinced that he discovered this while still a shepherd boy in the city of Bethlehem. How did he do this? I don't know exactly, but I'll speculate that as he's in the fields, we know that David was a psalmist and he played on his lyre, lyre and sung psalms and he composed them under inspiration. We can think of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want directly referencing his time as a shepherd. We can think of Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who hath displayed the splendor above the heavens. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy hand. We can see David in the open field as a shepherd, considering the heavens. That's Psalm 8. Perhaps Psalm 9 also came to him under inspiration while he was a shepherd in the fields. Psalm 9, and in particular, verse 11. Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare among his people his deeds. And so David, in some manner, was given under inspiration. Zion is the dwelling place of God. And I think this has to be while he's still in Bethlehem. Because when he, we come to 1 Samuel chapter 17, we see that David takes food to his brothers who are in the battle against the Philistines. And he sees the challenge of Goliath. And he takes on that challenge and he defeats the giant. And what does he do once he's defeated the giant? 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 54.
And David took the Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem. And he put his weapons in his tent. Jerusalem at that point was a Jebusite city, not a city of the children of Israel. And yet David knew at this point that that was the place that God had chosen to put his name. And he took Goliath's head there as a statement to the men of, Je of, of Jerusalem saying, be forewarned, I've killed the giant. I will come back for you. So before we get to David's kingship, there's one interlude that we should talk about. I noted previously that there was no place of worship during the reign of Saul, but it's not entirely true. In 1 Samuel chapter 21, we read about David fleeing Saul, and he came to the priests at Nob. Now, there's no mention of the tabernacle or the altar being there, but the priests at that time gave David the showbread. And the fact that there was showbread there infers that there was the table of the showbread there. And the table of the showbread belonged inside the tabernacle. And so it appears that for some time during the reign of Saul, although it may have been brief, that the priests had established the tabernacle in the city of Nob. But as soon as we hear about it, Saul sends Doeg the Edomite and murders the priests and it is no more. And yet the tabernacle again somehow survives and it shows up later as we will see. So we move on to the early reign of David. We know that at some point David finds the tabernacle and he sets it up in Gibeon. For we know in 1 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 39, at the time when he moves the ark to Jerusalem, it's stated that the tabernacle is set up along with the altar in the city of Gibeon. 2 Chronicles chapters, or 2 Chronicles 1, Verses 1 to 6 also tells us that this is the self-same tabernacle that was built by Bezalel in the wilderness. So it was the original tabernacle that was set up in Gibeon. So why in Gibeon? Well, first of all, in David's early reign, Jerusalem was still a Jebusite city and was in the hands of foreigners. And as we've already read from Joshua 9.23, the Gibeonites were to be hewers of wood and drawers of water for the house of God. And we also know from Joshua 21.17 that Gibeon was one of the cities, another one of the cities that was given to the sons of Aaron, the priests. And so you have the servants of the house of God, you have the priests there. And so it's an obvious place for David to set up the tabernacle have a place where the altar of God can be established and people can go to offer their sacrifices. But we also know that David's early uh, reign is marked with civil war with the descendants of Saul. But when we get to 2 Samuel chapter 5, the beginning of the chapter, we read how David's reign is finally consolidated and he reigns over all of Israel. He is crowned king over the whole nation. And his first recorded act of king over Israel, which we read about in 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 6, is to go and to take Jerusalem, the place that God chose for his name to dwell. David gets right down to business. This is his obsession, to find and establish that place. As soon as he takes it, he strengthens the city. And then, after a brief interruption by war with the Philistines, he gets right back to business and plans to move the ark. 
the Ark of God from the city of Kiriath-Jerim to Jerusalem. And so we read next in 2 Samuel chapter 6, also in 1 Chronicles chapters 15 and 16, how the, David goes about to move the ark. And we know that there are issues involved with that. We don't have time tonight to go into the issue of the incident with Uzzah and how that force caused him to stop and take a break. But after a short hiatus, which must have been heartbreaking to David, finally the ark was brought into the city of Jerusalem. And then the very next chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 7, David states his intent to build God a house. I'd never noticed it before, but it was obvious when I looked at it that David's plan was plain. As soon as he is made king, 2 Samuel 5, he takes Jerusalem. 2 Samuel 6, he moves the ark. 2 Samuel 7, he goes to build God a house. The urgency, the immediacy, the obsession is there. David needed to establish the place that God chose for his name to dwell. Imagine how he felt when God sent Nathan the prophet and said, no, not you, but your son will build my house. Just as an aside, as we consider this incident, I used to wonder why David didn't reunite the ark with the tabernacle. The tabernacle was in Gibeon. David brought the ark to Jerusalem. Why didn't he bring them together? But now it's clear. He didn't take the ark to Gibeon because as in, in his mind, the ark didn't belong in Gibeon. It belonged in Jerusalem. And he didn't bring the tabernacle to Jerusalem because his intent was to build God a house, a permanent dwelling for the ark. Well, the ark is in Jerusalem now, but that is not the end of the story. But David has to wait to the end of his life to finish it off. For most of his life, he's thinking that God has said no, and it's up to my children, my son, to build that house. And he accepts that fate and moves on. But at the end of his life, in 2 Samuel 24 and 1 Chronicles 21, we both, both chapters, we read about God being angry with Israel and causing David to number them. And this results in the angel of the Lord bringing three days of pestilence upon Israel. David was given a choice of three different curses, and that's the one he chose. And we read also how that plague is stopped at the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And it's at this point that David's obsession is reignited. Let's go to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. 1 Chronicles chapter 21, and we read in verse 18. Then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad, the prophet, to say to David, that David should go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So here the angel tells David to build the altar in this specific location. And David has a revelation. We read about it starting in verse, in verse 26 of chapter of First Chronicles 21. David built an altar to the Lord there and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. And he called to the Lord and he answered him with fire from heaven on the altar of burnt offering. And the Lord commanded the angel and he put his sword back in his sheath. At this time, David saw that the Lord had answered him 
on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. He offered sacrifice there. For the tabernacle of the Lord, which Moses made in the wilderness, and the altar of burnt offering were in the high place of Gibeon at that time. But David, David could not go before to it to inquire of the Lord, for he was terrified by the sword of the angel of the Lord. And there's a chapter break there, but I don't think we should see it as a chapter break because it follows immediately. Verse 1, then David said, this is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar of burnt offering for Israel. He came to realize that this is the specific place that God's house was to be built, the exact spot. And this revelation lights a fire under David. If we continue reading in 1 Chronicles, we see how in chapters 24 to chapter 27, he sets about organizing everything from the temple, the courses of the priests, the courses of the Levites, the musicians, the singers, the gatekeepers, all of the service of the, of the, in the operation of the temple are set in order by David. Chapter 29, all of the materials for the building of the temple are put, brought together. And it's not just that plan, but if we go to chapter 28 of 1 Chronicles, in verse 11, and I'd never realized this before until this study, it says David gave his son Solomon the plan for the how the plan for the porch of the temple, for its buildings, its storehouses, its upper rooms, its inner rooms, and the rooms for the mercy seat and the plan for all that he had in his mind in the courts of the house of the Lord in the surrounding rooms for the storehouses of the house of God and for the storehouses for the dedicated things. We call the temple Solomon's temple, but it was designed, the, the whole plan for it was laid out by David and given to Solomon. This is how it's going to be built. This is the material it's going to be built of. Built These are the dimensions. This is where this is going to go, and that's where that's going to go. But it's not David's plan, because David didn't make it up. First Chronicles 28, verse 19. All this, said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me all the details of this pattern. God had given him the temple. He saw it. It might have only been in vision, but he saw every detail of the temple. He saw its size, he saw its materials, he saw how it was put together. God fulfilled his desire for him to build that house without him actually building it. When I thought of this, I, I thought of Moses on Mount Nebo, seeing the promised land, never actually entering it, but seeing it top to bottom. And in the same way, David saw that temple inside and out, and gave that plan to his son, Solomon. So as we finish up, there's a lot of things that we can learn from David and from his discovery, his journey of discovery with the ark and with the place that God chose to put his name. First of all is the lesson of having zeal for God and for his ways. Psalm 69, 9 says, David says, for the zeal of thy house has consumed me. And we know that this is quoted by Christ in his zeal for the temple. 
and how we should be equally governed by zeal for God and for his things. David's life, his kingship was obsessed with the place that God chose to put his name. We also can be obsessed by God's plan and bringing it forward, bringing it to fruition. <clears throat> we also have a lesson of endurance as we see God's plans coming forth. For we all have, <clears throat> excuse me, we all have other incidences in our lives, things that don't go the way we wanted, and many of which are our own faults, as, as the moving of the ark originally was was, an, was done incorrectly and, and was bound to lead to disaster. We also can have these incidents in our lives where things don't go the way we want. Our intentions are good. We think we are doing God's will. And yet he thwarts our efforts. Also the idea of sometimes needing to step back. As David was told, not you, but others will do this work. Sometimes we need to take, stay, take, take a step back and let others do what we want to do because God has picked them to do that work. Also, the realization that fulfillment doesn't come always in the way we want it to come. Fulfillment comes in the way God wants it. And so David did see that temple in a glorious manner, but not in the manner in which he thought he would. And finally, having a realization that as David had to wait to the very end of his life to get that vision, to understand how God was going to fulfill his desire, we need to have patience also in God's timeline. God will bring things about in his own manner, in his own way, in his own time. So that is the lesson that we get from David and the Ark of the Covenant. Thank you.